Hello everyone, a warm welcome to this session on how to score a verbal 40 plus or close to a 93rd percentile on the GMAT uh, in the next 30 days so that you can apply before round two. So I wish uh, like I welcome all of you who have just joined me in the session today. I would love to guide you, guide you from my own understanding of how I improve my score from all the way from a verbal 13 to a verbal 41 and how over the years I have helped like thousands of students improve their scores on GMAT. So this is gonna be a really, really interesting session. So guys, uh, please let me know if I'm audible to all of you. My audio is perfect. You can just say a yes in the chat and uh, let's just set the tone right. Like I love to engage with you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to share them in the chat over here. I'll take them up as and when the right time comes in the session. And you can always send us an email also on support at the rate of gmatwiz.com if you want to ask questions from our team directly, okay? So please feel free to share your questions. And to those of you who are from India, uh, like me, uh, uh, very, very happy Diwali. I hope it was a great day yesterday for you and you had a lot of fun with your family. So let's get back into the Zimat zone. Like I understand Diwali is like a five day long uh, festival, but yeah, like round two is near. So I you know you are still probably with your family, but it's important that we get back into the Zimat mode. So let's get started with this session. And as, as you know, the heading of the session says quick score improvement plan to get to a, a, a verbal party plus before round two. And that's what gonna, we are gonna focus here today. And please understand that the quickest plan is actually something which uh, is, is requires you to learn in the right way. So if you are here to lear, learn a shortcut to kind of improve your score in GMAT verbal uh, through some magic or something, trust me, that's not gonna happen. Magic doesn't work on GMAT, there is no shortcut. What is required is right learning techniques. The problem is that most people don't know what are the right learning techniques. They actually fall for shortcuts. And because of those shortcuts, they end up taking longer time. So if you're actually wanting to complete your prep, test after six months of preparation. I prepared for nearly six months and I only scored a verbal 13 after six months, just because I was not studying the right way. And when I started studying the right way, in approximately about two more months of effort, I was able to improve my score to a 41 in the very first attempt, okay? And that's something which can happen to you as well. I totally understand Shubhadeep says, I'm extremely stressed because of verbal. I was also extremely stressed, Shubhadeep. I told you six months of hard work and effort, verbal score of 13. At the same time, my verbal score was 50 in quant. Very easily, I moved to a 50 in quant within, let's say, almost a month of effort. But six months of effort into verbal, I was at a verbal 13. I can totally understand, Shubhadeep, how you're feeling. And trust me, all of us are here to learn how to get rid of it. But many of you might be thinking, is it even possible? As Shubhadeep is also saying that, uh, is, it, is that even possible, Piyush? Like, I'm not really sure. I have just one month. I'm stressed. I just, I can understand those feelings which you're having, basically, Shubhadeep. Is it even possible? And just to start with some bit of motivation, yes, it is. Doesn't matter whether you're a retaker or a first-time test taker. Let's start with a story of a retaker. Okay, this is just for your motivation because this guy, this shirt that you see on your screen, was also watching one such webinar taken by me a couple of years back as a student, struggling, not sure how to do, what to do. And he was struggling at that point of time. Just to give you some idea, he studied for GMAT quite extensively. Almost he was into investment banking, was into a job which was very, very demanding. He studied using two different courses, Magush and eGMAT, for quite some time. And after that, he takes a GMAT. He scores a 670 in his first attempt with a verbal score of 34, even after all the effort, all the hard work that he has put into it. And then he does two more months of intensive practice. And this two more months of intensive practice was after the 670. And he did, does another mock test after two more months of intensive work on the weak areas. He gets a 670 again with a verbal 34. And I know many of you would have had a similar story like him. Many of you would have been in the same boat where you prepare for a long time and you don't see your scores changing. And trust me, at least on a daily basis, I speak to a couple of people like this. It's very common. This guy improved his score to a 740 in just 20 days using GMAT -based. with a verbal 41. He got selected to NCR as well as Kellogg. And right now he is a Kellogg, uh, sorry, NCR alumni. He's, he's NCR alumni, he has finished his MBA from NCR. 
and this guy has covered his entire interview in depth uh, i am not going to talk about his case completely here but if you want to watch his interview understand his take tips from him you can definitely check out the interview i'm going to link it in the chat here so that you can check this out but what i want you to understand is that this guy was also there watching one such similar webinar okay and he was able to see that improvement in just 20 days which he was not able to do for almost 6 months by then so it's definitely possible for a retaker what about a beginner nishant another someone who had no idea about how gmat works was a complete fresher into this thing he scored a 720 in the first attempt with an impressive score of verbal 41 and all of this he did in just 30 days time guys just 30 days by focusing on gmat with self based online course and learning the right methods and that's what is going to be the key today as well okay so let's understand how much effort does it really take if you are a retaker versus you are a first time test taker how much effort does it really take can you really do it before round 1 around 2 basically can you do that before round 2 let's understand that so if you are a retaker basically you require about 60 to 120 hours of focused effort now how much time do you need approximate calculation would be that if your score improvement required is let's say 5 to 6 points approximately in verbal then you are looking at approximately 60 hours of preparation time if your score improvement required in verbal is approximately around 10 to 11 points then you can get through this in about 120 hours with 120 hours of effort so if you require a score improvement between 5 to 11 points basically which is what most people need like if you are already at a 30 30 kind of a score or 29 28 kind of a score you want to get to a verbal 40 that is something possible with 60 220 hours of effort somewhere between that now if you are doing let's say if you are targeting round 2 then you are looking at let's say round 2 of foreign b schools like american or us or EU, european b schools would be somewhere in jan right so you are sit we are sitting on uh, 13th of november as we speak so we close to we close to 45 uh 50 days is what we have so you need to give approximately anywhere between 20 to 30 hours a week depending on how many days do you want the application buffer to be with you so if you want the application buffer of 15 days that okay i'll work on my application the last 15 days first 30 days i'm going to just focus on gmat you might require to put in 30 hours if you require 120 hours of effort overall so this is how you can do the calculation but definitely now is the time when you have to push yourself to get there okay now all of this are approximate numbers which i am telling you for detailed understanding of how much time you really take and how can gmat with team help you with the same in the learning process and all you can always schedule a call with our team we can definitely look at your case because there are multiple factors that are supposed to be taken into account so you can always schedule the call the link is in the chat here is the link you can always do that but try right now i'm trying to give you an approximate idea now if you are a first time test taker anywhere between 150 to 200 hours of effort might be needed and again if you're an amazing student i'm not talking about those people who are born brilliant i was not i was very very weak in verbal those who are born brilliant can do it in 100 hours of effort as well but if you're a general person like me you might need 150 to 200 hours and if you want to do it in 40 days uh, it is difficult but yeah you can still manage it with a little more extra effort on the weekends and uh, 3 hours on the weekdays that's something still possible which you can do if you are a first time test taker but i'm assuming most of you who are here are retakers or people who have at least prepared for gmat again i am using the word retaker very loosely uh, by retaker i doesn't i don't necessarily mean someone who has taken the gmat retaker could also be someone who is who has taken mocks and prepared for certain specific type so that's what i meant over here all right guys so this is the proximity the effort required but how do we start how do we do what what kind of uh, what is the first change that we need to bring and trust me you'll be actually seeing a very different thought process going over here and the first change that you need to bring in is the mindset change it's a mindset issue many of us and and and, and i would love to hear yes no from you guys in the chat i just see shubhra be participating in the chat i want more of you to respond i see around 37 person 37 people are here do let me know if you guys agree with this or not many of us like i am telling about i'm using the word us because it was me also who was struggling with this mindset issue back then when i was struggling with verbal we feel that It, the problem is with verbal the problem is with the way uh, things work basically right i i i am good at quant i'm not very good at verbal uh, i cannot do verbal it's 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 something which is because of the fact that i'm not a avid reader i have not been into reading books like i remember in my entire life when i prepare started preparing for gmat i had just completed one book just one book i used to start reading books with a lot of fervor a lot of passion 
uh, go through the first like 15 pages of 50% 30% of the book and then leave it and i was not into a lot of book reading either like in the entire year i might pick up one or two books that was that was the number even in, in the best cases one or two books i would say okay so that's how bad i was when it comes to reading i was not someone who was a avid reader and i always used to feel that in verbal there could be two correct choices basically that's something which i used to feel that okay quant you clear cut no this is the correct answer this is the wrong answer but in verbal there could be two correct answers it's subjective how many of you think that verbal is subjective do say a yes i always used to feel that i'm someone who is weak at grammar right my grammar is not best basically i cannot uh basically do well in verbal because my grammar is poor i'm not someone who is very good at i'm not from a convent school i i i'm i my family didn't used to speak english when i was a kid early in my career so obviously my grammar was not really great i used to think all of these things i used to think that okay i don't understand complex topics let's say for example uh modifiers or let's say whole phase those kind of questions gave me Uh, jitters and i always felt there is not enough time to solve verbal questions i have enough time for quant questions but not enough time to solve verbal questions how many of you feel like this how many of you feel like this i still see only uh shubhadeep saying a yes what about others is shubhadeep the only one who is struggling <laughs> i see a lot of you over here right so understand this guys if you have this mindset the first thing change is this mindset this mindset is something which is creating problems for you till the time you'll have this negative mindset it's not going to work you need to start thinking positively and that was the first change that i made personally like after scoring that verbal 13 the first change that i made was i took a challenge onto myself that why uh, did uh, exactly i score so poorly in verbal when i'm scoring so well in quant i took a challenge to myself that now i, I am someone who used to take pride in the fact that i can score quant 50 even if i'm asleep deep asleep you just wake me up and i can take a test and score a quant 50 for sure i used to take pride in myself by saying that and that day i took a challenge on myself that from now on i'll only say i'll, I'll only consider myself as a good test taker when i actually concur verbal so first thing was the positive thought process the change that first change that i did and i started with this thoughts and i'm telling you all this because these are really important things guys you might think i am going do we are we doing a philosophy discussion today no we are not doing a philosophy discussion but this thought process is definitely needed if you want to crack your verbal score first thing you have to understand is the problem is not with verbal agree to this it is because i will ver feel verbal is subjective if you think verbal is subjective you will always be stuck don't think verbal is subjective it's as objective as it it, it can be basically there is always one correct answer and four incorrect answer especially in schemat verbal there is always a rational behind the ones which are incorrect so don't think about verbal is subjective because the moment you think verbal is subjective you close your mind towards it you think nothing can be done it's a subjective thing right different people can have different opinions that's not the case with gmat verbal first understand that second thing you have to agree that the problem is not with you the problem is with the way you are solving questions so if you are changing the way you are solving questions the scores will also change similarly tell yourself that the verbal section is easy it's actually easier than quant because the answer is sitting right there in the question stem in front of you it's just that you're not looking at the answer in the right with the right frame of mind you have to look at the answer with the right frame of mind and you will get those answers trust me it is that easy and don't focus on solving more questions focus more on learning from each question a lot of people make this mistake that if they score poorly in verbal they try to go bonkers and they do 50 60 70 80 questions every single day trust me you can't learn that way like i reduced the number of questions that i was doing daily to almost one third and that really helped me we focus more on each question and focus more on following a set process this is the key guys a proper process is what we require for verbal and i see a great comment from samesh that this mindset change is actually the major problem solver i'm so glad that you agree with me on this particular part and i hope all of you understand this as well this is the first step that you need to take okay guys now a very quick intro about gmat wise again i'm 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 breaking the flow of the session uh, but just a little bit about our course who, who people who are not aware of us uh, we are world's only truly personalized gmat course when it comes to gmat preparation we have someone who has actually introduced the concept of ai into gmat prep and actually taken it to the next level where every student of gmat wise gets a personalized study plan irrespective of where 
uh, like they stand, they get a proper action plan which takes into account their preparation hours, their strengths, their weaknesses, and the action plan or study plan which is given to you is adaptive in real time. So if you are not doing well in any topic, you get real time improvement modules on those topics right away. And every single GMAT with student gets a dedicated mentor with whom they can connect every 10 to 15 days for a 15, 20 minute discussion around this strategy, around their uh, preparation strategy about what else they should do to improve their score. So we give dedicated mentors to all the people and we have multiple different options starting from as low as $149 for our two month plan. So if you want to check out more about GMATWIS, you can definitely uh, go to our website, www.gmatwiz.com and go to the plans and pricing page and check them out. And you can also register for a free trial of GMATWIS using this link, which I've given over here okay so that was a very short promotion about gmat uh, but let's get going again into the session so first change is the thought process but the second change now this is the thought process change that we talked about okay how do you align your thoughts in the right direction it has to be a new start a fresh start for you from now you need to treat verbal differently but where do we go wrong when we actually start our preparation where do we go wrong what's the root cause of all the issues that we face let's try to understand that the main issue with most students is that when they start studying, their focus is like this. Okay, I call, I learn concepts, I do practice of questions, and I do take tests. Basically, this is the in, in simplest possible way. This is how people learn. They learn uh, by learning concepts, then going to practicing questions and taking tests. Let's take an example. Basically, uh, when I started, basically when I started the GMAT verbal preparation. Or GMAT preparation in general. This is how I looked at verb, like GMAT. Okay, quant is something which is maths. Verbal is nothing but English. That's that's the English language which I have to be good about. Sentence correction is grammar and reading comprehension is plain simple reading. Okay, and that's how I, I thought, and that's how most people think. It was not just not just me. I I, I studied. Uh, with a very well-known coaching institute in Calcutta, India. Like I, I'm from Calcutta, so there's a very well-known coaching. in India, I, started, I like that and I started with that and, and I saw most people what they, they teach you in the same way. So that's how I started. And, and I remember when I was starting with sentence collection, that was one of the first sections that I picked up. Uh, I bought a book which was Ren and Martin. Obviously, there were study material which was given to me by my coaching. I also uh, look, took this book, like one of my teachers told, you need to strengthen your grammar. Your grammar is pretty poor. So I bought this book, Ren and Martin, and multiple other books as well. Like I think Manhattan also I bought uh, maybe a week or two later. And what I did was I started learning various concepts, like simple, complex compound sentences, adverbs. And all those were fine. I was doing well when it comes to rules. The problem started when there were more rules and then exceptions to those rules started. And it was not just exceptions to those rules. There were exceptions to these exceptions as well. That's when the real trouble happened. Like, okay, these are exceptions. I understand that. But then there are exceptions to exceptions also. How do I deal with that? Not really sure. And after two months of preparation, I remember after two months of preparation, I remember I knew thousands of rules, at least thousands of rules I learned. I memorized a lot, but I was not able to remember all of them. Obviously, sometimes I used to forget one, sometimes I used to forget others. And my scores were still inconsistent because I was missing this rule this time around, something else, I was missing some other rule. So it was always very haphazard. I was never confident about whether this is the correct answer or not. Now, when it comes to RC, the problem was even worse. Like SC, at least I was able to understand that, okay, I did not apply this rule. That, that's where I'm going wrong. But what's happening with RC? I was not even able to figure out. Like when I started RC, I remember I learned about the various type of questions. Okay, there is a main point question which requires you to talk about the main idea. What is the intent of the author? Then there is something called inference. There's something called detail. Again, there were different type of questions. I learned about the scope of each question. Type. That was fine. Then I went into solving questions. So I used to solve my study material questions. Teachers taught, told me, do you read newspapers? You need to read newspapers, novels. And I worked on my vocabulary also. I remember in the first two months, I remembered almost 2,000 new words. I, I wrote down like a big list of words. And I wasted a lot of time in, in doing so. In, in the hindsight, I look at it that way. And, and, and then I was struggling. So I went to the tutors. I'm not able to do well in RCs. I don't know why. I'm just getting one out of four questions, or at best, two out of four questions correct in a passage. How do I improve? And most teachers used to say, you need to kind of give more time to the options. So you need to understand the passage faster. You need to skim through the passage, spend less time on the passage, solve more passages. Nothing was helping me, trust me. I did all of that six months. I told you, right, six months of all this verbal score was just 13. Really, really bad uh, score after that. The main issue 
which I now look at and I understand is that the problem with me in verbal was that no one actually taught me how to read a passage. Everyone was re teaching me how to solve questions, but no one taught me how to read a passage. Okay, this is how you read the information, right? At least I need to understand the information. RC should be the easiest section because in RC, the question in, it has the answer, right? It has the answer in it. If you just understand the passage, you will be able to get the answer. But if you don't understand the passage, you'll not be able to get the answer. Problem was, no one was teaching me how to read a passage. I remember my very first class, like teacher told me these are the type of questions, gave me a handout, asked me to solve a few passages. And then she came after like an hour or so, started solving questions. And she started with questions directly. And then for each question, she used to refer to a certain part of the passage. And I used to wonder, how do I know that this question is related to this part? Probably it will come with a lot more practice. But I never understood that this is how there is a proper step-by-step -step approach required to read RCs also. I was not aware of that. Okay, my focus was completely fo like on time-saving reading strategies, which was skimming. And how many of you use skimming in RCs? How many of you follow that? Like, okay, let's read the first line, last line, or just read the passage quickly and come back to it for each question. How many of you do that? Let's say a yes quickly if you are doing that, basically. Cody says RC is a major pain point for me. For me, it was also the biggest problem area, to be honest, out of all three. RC, then SC, and CR was still the easiest because it used to be a little more logical is uh, what I felt, basically. Obviously, I was all weak at all three, but still, this was the thing. Now, the main identification, which I do now, is that I was not able to read properly. Now, I'm going to talk about a little about quant. And I, I, am, I want to do that because I want you to understand and compare where do we go wrong with verbal. OK, now you might think, OK, Piyush, this is a verbal session. Why are you talking about quant? This is important because the problem with us is that we treat quant logically, okay? Maybe because of a schooling, we have learned quant in a process-driven manner from school, not the same for verbal. But in verbal, we don't treat it logically. We feel verbal is about subjectivity. Verbal is about reading things, informing, uh, like uh, just solving questions. We don't learn a method, and that's where things go wrong. You have to treat verbal also logically. Let's understand how we approach quant. So, for example. There's something called concept learning that we do. If I take a simple example, for equations, we know if you have to solve for two equations or two variables, let's say x and y, we need two equations minimum for that, right? We know that. We, we learned that, that as a concept. You need two equations to solve for two variables. Also, we know that if there is an addition, additional constraint which is given to you, sometimes, it is possible you can solve using one equation as well. So you can solve for x and y using one equation if there are certain constraints. So we learned this concept. We learned this concept in school, uh, maybe high school, wherever. But then we didn't stop at it. We actually learned a right method as well. So for example, this is the question which is in front of you. I wanted you guys to solve this question. OK, I'll, I'll give you one minute to kind of just read the question. Uh, try to think about the approach that you will follow. Just a minute. I'm going to be on mute on that, that, that time so that you can focus on this. And then we are going to talk about this question. OK? Not necessarily solve it, but the main idea that you So I'm going on mute. You have one minute. Okay, right, so one minute is over. Again, I did not give you enough time to solve this question because I just wanted you to kind of frame your thoughts around this. Now, why I gave this question is to bring uh, about an important point. So if you learn this concept and the process properly, you would solve this question in a systematic way. Otherwise, what many people do is they just see, okay, x and y are positive integers and some equation is given how many values of x are possible. So if you 
uh, know the right method. The right method to solve this question is that uh, if this is the equation, you need to bring one variable to one side and the other variable to the other side. Then you need, do you know that this is a positive integer? So this has to be a multiple of three. This has to be a multiple of three. If it is a multiple of three, this side also is a multiple of three. So we can write it as a multiple of three. We can write it in the form of a multiple of three. So this is the format that we can write it as. So we know 75 is a multiple of three, six X is a multiple of three because X is a positive integer. So six X is a multiple of three. So this has to be a multiple of three also. So if it is a multiple of three, then we know X equal to two can fit. So if we put X equal to two in this equation, we can find one value for y which will fit. So if you put, put x equal to 2, y equal to 22 will fit this equation. And then you can just increase the value of x by the coefficient of y, which is 3. You can increase the value of x by the coefficient of y, and you can decrease the value of y, uh, y by the coefficient of x, which is 5. And you can continue doing that to get multiple answers. Okay, again, I'm not going to teach you this concept. This concept is taught in, uh, uh, like it's taught in depth in different courses, even GMAT West. The reason I cannot teach you this is because this is not a current class. But what I want you to show, learn is that I solve this question. I can solve this question in almost a minute, a minute and a half maximum if I know the right method. So what we do in quant is that we always learn a concept and we always learn a method along with it. If you know the method, you can solve the question faster. On the other hand, if you don't know this method and you just try to pick random values for x, okay, let me try with x equal to 1, x equal to 2, x equal to 3, x equal to 4, 5, 6, you will take eternity to solve this question and you'll probably the mark okay cannot be determined is the correct answer which is not like the correct answer is five we have five different values possible in this case basically but you will not be able to do that if you don't know the right method but many of you probably know this method already you might have learned this method we and i'm just taking one area in quant you take about any area because it's permutation combination coordinate geometry we always learn concepts then we learn methods in verbal what is the method? We don't learn methods at all. We just learn concepts. We just know what type of questions exist. And we just delve into solving questions. There's no methodology. A lot of you might think skimming is a method. It's not a method, guys. Method is something which works on every question. You, many of you might think, okay, in sentence corrections, splits approach is the method. You look at the vertical scanning, looking at the differences in the options and applying the grammar rules. That's not a method. That's a shortcut. A method is something which works on all questions, is a proper logical way of solving the question. Trust me, I never learned that in school, for verbal, at least in my school. I am from an English media background. No one taught me how to read passages. And with that, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Many of you might be thinking, Piyush, I, I solve questions methodically. Let's see whether you do it or not. So let's do an official question. And in the interest of time, I've taken a not interest of time, obviously, interest of the phase right now. We are in a phase where a lot of people are transitioning to GMAT focus. So let's focus on RC, which is there in both GMAT classic as well as GMAT focus. So this is an official passage. I've given you just the first part of the passage. And there's a question which is associated with the passage. So I want you guys, and this question can be answered through the first para itself. So I want you guys to take a shot at this passage. I'm going to give you about uh, five minutes okay so if you're just joined the session to solve this question if you're watching a recording you can uh, obviously pause and solve this that is the best option but if you want to skip this you can always move forward five minutes to see the analysis and again guys my objective in the session today is not to teach okay so we'll focus on that more importantly so i'm gonna be on mute for the next five minutes all the best take give you 100 percent to this question i'm gonna go full screen mode and I'm also going to remove the banner of GMAT club for one minute. Now you should be able to read the passage completely and anyone sees a problem with the uh, font or something just uh, change the settings and make it HD make the uh, like the quality of the video to HD and then you'll be able to see everything properly. Okay, all the best you have five minutes guys.
those of you who have solved this question, four and a half minutes are already over, by the way. So if you've solved this question, you can start putting your answers in the chat, A, B, C, D, E, you can pick that up, pick the right answer. Okay. All right, guys, I think five minutes are over now. Okay, so I've given five minutes to all of you to solve this question. Again, uh, those of you who have solved this, feel free to share your answers in the chat. You can continue doing that and I, I'll, I'll proceed with the session in the interest of time because obviously our objective is not just to solve this question, but to help you improve your verbal score. Now, what you need to understand is that right now what I'm gonna show you is the strategy that I follow to read the passage, the approach that I follow to read the passage. And that's something which you need to compare with your approach. So understand whether you are under using the same approach to read or not. So it's not important whether you get the right answer to this question. Many of you might get the right answer. Some of you might get the wrong answer. What is more important is that you check your approach and you match your approach. If your approach matches, Trust me, you will actually get the right answer more often than not. That's for sure. If your approach doesn't matter, you could get lucky with one question, you may not get lucky with another. The main thing is the approach. And if your approach doesn't match, try to take learnings from it. Now, when, like if I talk about old Piyush, the Piyush who used to struggle with verbal, the common problems that I faced with RC is that after reading the passage, I was confused about the meaning of the passage. I was not sure what is the correct understanding. I used to have some idea that the passage is about this, idea, this thing exactly telling me. I was not really sure of that. I was always confused about the meaning. I used to re re refer back to the passage again and again. There was a constant need to do that. I felt that need all the time. And I was always low on confidence while marking the answers. Even, even after going back to the passage, I used to uh, be in a situation where I'm still confused with the two choices. I'm not sure what is the correct answer. Vipul was talking about that happens with him in CR questions. I can understand Vipul. It happened to me across all three sections. And that is something which happens if you don't read the information correctly or you don't understand the question correctly or you don't do the pre-thinking, which is what you do in CR. But let's focus on RC for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this question. I'm going to read this passage and I'm going to focus on important aspects. I want you guys to notice them. I want you guys to tell me whether you do this or not. Okay. So thank you so much, Vipul, Gabriel, and Subhuldi for your responses. I see only three of you have solved this question. There are 20 plus people in the session. Maybe other people are not sure about the answers. They are probably worried that their names will be exposed if they put in the wrong answer. But don't think about that, guys. Just, just put in your answers, whatever you think is the correct answer here. But anyway, let's start reading the passage. So when I read passages now, I read it them slowly. Earlier, I used to follow a skimming approach, which is like fast reading, speed reading. Now I read passages slowly. I read them one step at a time, understand them properly as I move forward. So let's read this. It is an odd but indisputable fact. So when I see this, what I understand is, this is what is the author's opinion. This is the author's viewpoint. It is an odd but indisputable fact. This is author's language. So this is something which the author is agreeing with. So he's talking about something which is okay. He believes this is odd. This is something which is not expected. But at the same time, there's no dispute around this. No one can argue about this. This is inarguable, basically. What is this inarguable fact? What is this odd fact? Let's read that. So I'm talking about a fact now and try to see what I'm, how am I doing it. I'm thinking about author's opinion. I'm focusing on the main ideas. I'm also connecting. Okay, he's talking about a fact. What fact is it? Fact that, okay, that the 17th century English women, who are these English women are generally regarded as the forerunners of modern feminism. Okay, so these are generally people like or people who did believe in the idea of modern feminism. They came up with the idea. Maybe they are forerunners. Okay, what about the 17th century English women? Let's see are almost all, almost all of them identified with the royalist side in the conflict between royalists and parliamentarians. And this conflict was known as the civil wars. Okay, so I understand that there's something called civil wars. There's a conflict going between two parties, R versus P. And what I know is that the odd fact is that almost all these English women who were feminists, who were the modern, uh, like foreigners of modern feminism, almost all of them were on the royalist side. So probably the author, this is the first line. This is the fact which the author tells. This is odd. Why is this odd? Uh, probably because all of them are on this side. But why? Why is that odd? 
he is probably going to give me more context as we move forward. So what you need to understand is I broke down the sentence, read it slowly, understood what the sentence says in one go, understood what is the author's opinion, understood what is odd. I tried to contextualize things better. Okay, let's read further. Since royalist ideology, again, this is a very complex passage, and this is something which is which can work on the complex passage, can easily work on simple passages. In fact, work faster on simple passages. Since royalist ideology, okay, so the moment I see the word since, I need that I know there is a cause and effect probably which is going coming going to come up. Okay, so there's a cause. Okay, since what is the cause? Royalist ideology, okay, one of the parties' ideology is often associated. Now he says often associated. Then this means it is a third party opinion. I don't know whether the author is agreeing to this or not. When he used this the word often, often means usually. Again, doesn't really mean he agrees to it or not. I don't know that yet. Okay. So since royalist ideology is often associated with the radical patriarchalism of 17th century political theorist Robert Filmer. Okay, there was this guy called RF. He has a certain method of uh, uh, philosophy or theory, which is radical patriarchalism. I don't know what that is. Now I see a hyphen. I see a patriarchalism that. So this is probably defining the radical patriarchalism. Okay. So I have a cause. The cause is, okay, since royalist ideology is often associated with the patriarchalism of a guy, then something happens. Then what is that thing which is happening? Probably this is the portion, which is the cause, which is the effect. Sorry. This is the effect of of the thing so this is the effect and that one is the cause but okay let's read the effect later let's understand what this patriarchalism is all about okay so a patriarchalism that equates family and kingdom okay says that these two are equal family and kingdom and asserts the divinely ordained absolute power of the king okay asserts the divinely ordained absolute power of the king okay in the kingdom the king has the power basically asserts this power and by analogy of the male head of the household okay so since this patriarchalism says family is similar to a kingdom since kings rule the kingdom family should also be uh, led or ruled by the male head so that is the radical patriarchalism it's a very radical approach towards that so what the author is saying is that since royalist ideology is associated with this kind of patriarchalism this radical patriarchalism something happens historians have understandably puzzled have been understandably puzzled. So, okay, this is the author, third party's point of view, historian's point of view. But the moment I see the word understandably puzzled, I understand that the author is also agreeing to this. This is again the author's opinion. He agrees to this, that whether this puzzling is something that is understandable. He understands, he agrees with that. Why have they, they been puzzled? They have been puzzled by the fact the assertion of women, rational and moral equality with men. Okay, so he's saying they are puzzled with the fact that why are these royalist women the ones who actually criticized the subordination of women in marriage? Because if royalist ideology itself is based on such a radical patriarchalism, they should be supportive of it, right? That should be the thought process because these are royalist uh women these are uh, parliamentarians who are actually uh, royalists on the royalist side so their entire ideology is supposed to be based on this it's supposed to be based on this then why is this happening so through this sentence he is telling us that there is a difference in thought process between the royalist ideology and the royalist women there is a slight difference in thought process he's highlighting that through this particular sentence let's read further he's probably going to build up more context some historians have questioned okay he's talking about some historians he's not saying himself some historians have questioned the facile equation of i did not know the word facile meaning of the word facile doesn't matter equation of the royalist ideology with filmarian patriarchalism so they some people he's saying that some people have questioned whether actually royalist ideology is based on filmarian patriarchalism or not because if that's not the case then there's nothing to be puzzled about it over here then he says, and indeed, now what is the word indeed doing here? Indeed is again telling us that author agrees to this. So till now, this was a third party point of view, right? Some historians have questioned. But then he says, and indeed, there may have been no consistent differences between royalists and parliamentarians on issues of family organization and women political rights. He's saying that he also believes that it might not be the Pimpinbarian patriarchalism that the royalist ideology is focused on till this point. And then he uses the word, but then he changes the thought process. But in that case, 
one would expect early feminists to be equally divided amongst the two sides so he says since they are not equally divided amongst the two sides there is a possibility there is a strong possibility that the royalist ideology is actually based on pillaging patriarchalism so what is the third line telling us third line is giving us some idea about uh, why the royalist ideology would be focused on the pre-revolutionary patriarchalism is is just playing with that those thoughts so in the entire para i understand that the author has talked about a indisputable fact that all women all all women who are modern uh, sorry foreigners of modern feminism are on one side and he tries to present why this fact is odd this fact is odd because their ideology itself is focused on radical patriarchalism why then they are the ones who are actually the biggest criticizers of it so that's a paradox with the first paragraph presents and the moment i understand it i also understand that probably in the second paragraph he's going to help me in understanding how this happened how this women who were supposed to follow royalist ideology ended up becoming the biggest criticizers and and in reality it it, it the same way it happened it, it that was the thing which happened in the first para now that's what i was trying to say so summarizing i'm just trying to summarize my mind map over here the way i looked at it was introduction of an indisputable fact then he says why this fact is strange he's he's presenting his agreement to it as well and then he's presenting that there should be a reason for this anomaly why this why this exists there should be a reason for it and that's why i know that the next para is going to talk about that and if you look at the next para i just not show that he actually talks about the reason in the next para so what i'm doing here when i'm reading this passage is not just reading this passage i'm trying to understand i'm trying to correlate i'm trying to prethink i'm trying to preempt what is going to happen next now the beauty of preempting is that if you do the preempting bit you are automatically able to understand things much better you are automatically able to relate to things much faster and that helps you in solving the questions much faster as well please understand that okay so what was what is the time that i spent so when i was solving this patch for the very first time i remember i spent 3 and a half minutes on the first para it took me that long because the first para was complex now some of you might think piyush if you're taking 3 and a half minutes on the first para this is a two para passage you will spend a 7 minutes on the entire passage no trust me gmat won't give you a passage where you need to spend 7 minutes why not because if they give you a passage which has like which where you have to spend 7 minutes on reading it and then you don't have time for solving it so it won't come on gmat if they are giving you a lengthy passage it will read easy for sure you will save time somewhere or the other and because i read the first para very well i understood the context very well i was able to read the second para in one and a half minutes very easily because the second para was just elaborating on the reason it was very easy for me to relate to the things and the best part of all of this was i was able to solve four questions based on this passage in just four minutes so if you look at my overall time i spent nine minutes on this passage and i got all four out of four questions correct and this is by the way guys a 750 level passage this is the one of the most difficult passages that you will get on the gmat some of the most difficult complex language complex questions still i was able to get them four out of four right in 9 minutes which is gold on gmat trust me like uh, if you can get a 750 level question correct all four of them in this much time it's great now i know how what many of you would be thinking like many of you might be thinking piyush uh, is this even possible to read this first para in 3 and a half minutes and do the level of analysis that you did trust me guys it it is possible it is possible skimming is not the right approach many people skim through the information they read the first para in 1 and a half minutes they read the next para in 1 and a half minutes the problem with this is not this part when you skim through the such passages or such information you only get a rough understanding of what's stated over here and that's when you take a lot of time on the questions for for every question you would need to go back to the passage again and again you might end up spending close to 2 minutes on all the questions overall 7 minutes on the question part and what you don't realize is that you just think it up giving 10 minutes and even in this 10 minutes the worst part is not this if you don't understand the passage even if you are giving 2 minutes per question you will most likely still get the questions wrong that happens very 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 commonly it used to happen with me i have have been stuck in that situation for a long time i was stuck in that situation for a long time i remember i used to skim through passages read them in 2 3 minutes and do a lot of back and forth between the question and the option at the end i was stuck in two choices one of those two used to be correct but i was never confident about the answer and you know what is the worst part about not being confident it's not that you score poorly it's that you actually 
are always afraid of verbal. You will never feel confident of verbal. You will never feel exam ready. On the day of the test, you will feel anxious. You will never feel that uh, confidence in you to take the test. And that's the worst thing that can happen to you. You are putting in the hours and hours and hours of effort, and you are not seeing any outcome. It's like you don't know when this road is going to end for you, right? The journey is going to end for you. It seems like an endless journey. That's the problem, not having that hope. But if you read information correctly, if you understand information correctly, you know you understand the context. You can answer every question, and that's what is required to improve your verbal score. We have spent on reading the two paras. This is the time that we spent on answering the questions, okay? And, and try to compare this with the time that I spent, okay? I spent less time overall. Understand this. I spent less time overall. I'm saving a minute. I'm saving time, and I'm also having a higher accuracy at the same time. And and and, and what you need to understand here is that. You are also doing if you are skimming like this is the skimming approach that I am talking about over here. If you are skimming in RCs, you are also actually spending a lot of time on reading. It's just that instead of doing it upfront, you are actually doing it later. So if you have to reread things, why not read them in the first place correctly? If you invest time on reading it in the first place, you will get the questions correct. You will end up saving time also. The problem is people don't commit to that. People don't commit to that, and let me tell you guys, this is not something which will happen with you on day one. It's not something which will happen to you on day one. If you expect that this is possible on day one, can you do it on from day one? The answer is a big, big no. You cannot read information so well the way I did in three and a half minutes in for the first para. Like in the entire para passage, I spent five minutes. You cannot understand and do the same level of analysis on day one. That's for sure. That won't happen on day one. On day one, what will happen is that if you actually focus on the right strategy, initial stages, you will take seven to ten minutes to read the passage. You will, and timing efficiency will only develop over time. It's something which is only developed over time. You will still be able to solve questions faster. That's for sure. Four to five minutes is what you will take for four questions if you are learning the right approach. And overall time per question passage is going to be fourteen to fifteen minutes in initial days. Maybe on day one, day two, day three. But as you go to advanced stages of this, you'll start understanding that okay, uh, if you saw my viewpoint, I was able to see okay, it is an indisputable or an indisputable fact. So the moment I saw it, I knew it's an author's opinion. The moment I saw some historians have argued, I know this is a third-party opinion. I was able to focus on the word understandably. I was able to focus on those words because now I understand how to contextualize things faster. I was able to see sense. There's a cause and effect. There was something in between which is explaining something else. I'm able to understand sentence structures better. I'm able to understand where an example is coming. So obviously, through the example, I can read through faster. I don't have to do that level of analysis. All these efficiencies kick in as you go to the advanced stage, and you will be able to then solve passages in eight to nine minutes. But you have to go through the initial stages to the advanced stage. There is no shortcut. No shortcut. No one can actually bring you to the advanced stage directly. Okay, and this is what happens with our learning process for every skill that we learn. Okay, remember your driving days. I am teaching my wife how to drive a car, and I and when I see her, I I realize like ten years back I was at the same place. I I when I started driving a car, I had to think about the back mirror, the right mirror, the left mirror, everything at the same time about the gearbox, all those changes I have to do in that fraction of a second. It used to be a very very difficult task. Now I can drive a car even while talking on the phone. I don't do that, by the way, but I'm just saying I can easily drive a car. It has become a subconscious process for me because certain things have become natural for me, and that doesn't that didn't take ten years to become natural. It was something which I was able to do in a month's time easily. So it happens over a period of time when you repeat the same approach. That's when your subconscious mind kicks in, and that's the right learning process that you have to follow for everything in your life. It's not just for Driving, singing, dancing, anything that you learn, it is same for GMAT also, guys. Please understand that. So that style of solving questions is what you require. That thought process. Okay, I've been doing a monologue, guys. Uh, so are you able to understand relate to what I'm saying here? A quick yes no will really really help if I'm making sense or not. <laughs> if I'm not, then obviously, uh, like uh, you need to tell me what what like is there a doubt in your mind? Please feel free to ask me. But I'm pretty sure that. This all would be something that you would be able to relate to. Why am I confident about that? Because I've I've been stuck on verbal 
13 for a long long time it pains a lot trust me it's not easy to see a verbal score of 13 after 6 months of preparation it's a very low score right i feel bad to say that i feel, felt bad when i saw that score in my first mock but i i, I feel proud that i was able to move to a verbal 41 after this like proper effort of 2 months focus in the right direction okay so jairaj all the best if you have the gmat tomorrow uh, it, it's too late to kind of uh, me being able to give you something for tomorrow just focus on staying calm and composed and taking the test and feel free to reach out to me if you want to discuss about your preparation later happy to discuss that and i'm going to give you the link to schedule a call on my calendar but hope uh, you would have reached out to me a little earlier i could have given you more insights but in case anyone else also wants to reach out to me discuss about their case feel free to do this using this link so thank you so much subhadeep and vipul uh, for saying that yes i know uh, uh, how how verbal thought process is with students i have been at that place and trust me this thought process can actually help you now coming to the question uh, i need to solve this question also because i gave you guys uh, this question to solve so it's very important for us to solve this question let's see uh, the author of the passage refers to robert filmer in order to primarily in order to so he's asking uh, why has the author referred to robert filmer now why has he referred to robert filmer if you look at the second sentence this is where he referred to robert filmer he did that to present the fact that there is a difference there is a difference in the thought process of royalis and the difference in the thought process of royalist women who were the early feminists there is a difference in that. even though the ideology seems to be the same uh, seems to be similar there is a there is a difference in their thought process there is a the difference that is there why the difference is there that's not the question here he's just talking about that there is a difference that's the objective of the second line let's go with the options one by one show that royalist ideology was somewhat more radical than most historians appear to realize that's not the objective at all he's not talking about whether it is more radical less radical that's not the objective qualify the claim that patriarchalism formed the basis of royalist ideology not really he is not qualifying he is not putting limits to the claim that okay in this case it is it is only uh, to this degree that it is forming the basis of royalist ideology even uh, that is something which is happening in the third line a little bit it is still not qualifying the claim as such question the view that most early feminists were associated with royalist faction no in fact he has clearly said it's an indisputable fact he is clearly saying that most feminists were on the royalist faction highlight an apparent tension between uh, the royalist ideology and the ideas of early feminists definitely yes this is the answer that we were looking for argue that royalists had held conflicting opinion on issues of family organization no he is not arguing he is not uh, presenting that whether they did held conflicting opinions or not he is presenting clearly that they had different thought process and not just saying about general loyalists saying royalists and royalist women that point of view is point trying to say that okay they these two had different thoughts like ideologies ideology was different from what royalist women thought is not just talk more general royalist either so arguing talking about general royalist that will be incorrect over here so option e is also incorrect d is the answer which is the correct answer okay so most of you got this right which i'm really really happy about but what is more important is did you read the passage in the same way so understand that skimming word work on gmat ever ever it can work on a test like ilts why because in ilts it's a language test it just requires you to focus on basic understanding gmat is a inference based test in ilts you will get questions which are detail questions almost all questions are detail questions in gmat rcs 85% questions are inferential in nature either focused on inference main point function structure application all of this need you to read between the lines you will have the answer in the passage but you have to draw the inferences the answer won't be directly written in the passage you have to connect that information okay and that's what you need to understand okay so in order to solve the problem that you are facing you have to focus not on your reading speed you have to focus more on your comprehension speed if you have to improve something improve the way you comprehend comprehend better comprehend faster rather than reading faster and the worst the thing you need to understand is that to, to comprehend faster you have to read slower yeah exactly when the the funny part is when i actually scored a verbal 13 and if i look back at piyush who scored a verbal 13 after 6 months of prep i used to be a much i used to be a fast reader i used to read like almost 1.5x the speed of what i read today 
when I have scored a verbal 41 on GMAT. So I used to be a fast reader back then. I had to slow down my pace of reading. To do what? To improve my comprehension. So my comprehension is probably 3x better now. 3x better now. My comprehension is 3x better. My reading is probably 1.5x lower. Okay, that's that's the kind of thing. And you need to develop the right uh, RC skills. That is something which you have to focus on also. So you have to understand where to pause. It's not important that you pause at every point. I did not focus on every point. And for this, a little bit of understanding of sentence structure is also needed. Okay, again, that's something which we generally learn in GMAT RC. So even if you, sentence correction rather. Uh, so if you guys actually are taking a, a, on GMAT focus also, I know in GMAT focus, SC is not there, but at least you need to understand basic sentence structures. You don't need to worry about grammar rules, but you need to understand basic sentence structure, where to pause. You have to take care of complex words, basically. You have to understand how to differentiate between a fact and an opinion whether it's a facts or an opinion. And you have to also understand what is author's opinion and what is a third party opinion, okay? And all of this should be dealt with while thinking about the intent of the author also. That's something which is also equally important to think about. You have to think about the intent of the author as well, keeping all of this in mind, okay? The main idea, the main end goal is to understand the intent. If you get the intent right, you get everything else right. That's something which is important, okay? so. I have a question. I have actually a couple of questions. The one question is by Vatsal. I'll take that up also in some short while. I'll take up the question of Sudhodi that's related to exactly what we are talking about right now. Would you recommend writing small phrases after each para that really helps me with my accuracy? Uh, Sudhodi, initially, yes. So initially when I was uh, at your stage, I used to kind of write down certain small summaries in my notebook, but initially, not at the advanced stages. You need to keep in mind that writing also takes extra time. You cannot take extra time for writing. And the problem with writing is not just extra time. The problem is that you rely more on pen and paper rather than your memory. So please understand, you have to phase this out. So initially, if you're doing this is okay, but keep in mind that you have to rely on your mental map more important than the when what you write on each uh, for each para. Okay, so even today, I write one or two words, that's okay, but nothing more than that. I don't write like entire uh, sentences for each para. No, I don't focus on what is written. I, I focus more on why it is written. I focus on the intent part. If you're doing that, with, a, with uh, that is fine. And if you're do, taking more notes in between initially, it is okay. But you have to focus on uh, taking less notes as you move forward. That's something which is important. Okay, Apurva says, but when I write the para, I never go back to read it again. So should I continue doing it? No, Apurva, you should not ever read it again. That's the problem. See, you should not think about reading it again. Another re recommendation which I give to a lot of students who actually understand information well. Sometimes what happens is even if they understand information well, whenever they get stuck in the options, now their first instinct is to go back to the passage. Stop that instinct. Rest, rather, try to solve the question from your understanding of the passage itself. If you go back and back again and again, you'll unnecessarily waste time and you will get questions wrong also. So try to read things well and answer questions from your understanding. Only in one out of four or five questions, you should go back to the passage. So Apurva, you should not read the passages again. And writing passages, paras down uh, to not read it again is even worse. Okay, Writing things down should be done with the focus on the intent of what's written. And trust me, guys, you can keep in mind information for five to seven minutes very easily. It's not that difficult. You have to just train your mind. So initially, if you're writing important information, it's OK. But gradually, you have to phase it out. All right? So, First thing you need to learn in order to improve your RC is to learn how to read. That's important. What kind of reading you need to do. And there are multiple steps involved in it. If you remember these steps, right? Everything, pausing, understanding how to take off complex words, how to take care of facts and opinions. And that's why at GMATWiz, we have approximately, if you see about eight hours of course content in RC, and this is our level one, this is our unit one. We are not even talking about different type of questions. We are just focusing on individual steps like involved reading, transition word, paragraph summaries. And there will be videos where we'll teach you the steps. And then there are focused questions which will test you on these steps. So there are focused questions where you apply this information, apply this knowledge, and then you go to the next step videos. Then you have focused questions on those videos. And in this fashion, you move forward. So what happens eventually is 
just a second. What happens eventually is that you learn things in a systematic fashion. So whatever method you follow, it's important that you first improve your reading style. Because if your reading style is wrong, if you don't learn how to read well, then you will not be able to solve questions. And that's why in GMAT we have eight hours of module dedicated to that. And we teach all these things in depth. Okay, so this is something which is important. And this is something which helped me in my study schedule. So going back again, I remember study schedule of old Piyush was learn concepts, practice questions, do more questions or read the tutorials. And I wasn't that, leave, if you watch this movie, uh, live, die, repeat, you'll probably recollect what happened here. That was the same thing which was happening with me. Repeating the same thing again and again, didn't get me the outcome. Skill-based learning says you understand these three skills. You learn these three skills. You don't just focus on just doing questions randomly or just practicing questions. Develop skills. Which skills am I talking about? Comprehension, which is about understanding individual sentences well. You learn analytical reasoning, which is about connecting information, connecting one sentence with another. You understand how to focus on the main idea, breaking out the crux of the information or the intent of the author, why something has been written. And if you match this skill-based learning, you'll understand that SC is only testing on skill one. CR is testing you on skill one and skill two. RC is testing you on all three skills. So logically, the best sequence to study is that you study SC first, then CR, then RC. Now, obviously, if you're preparing for the GMAT focus edition, you need to focus on these two. So for the focus edition, you just need to focus on this two, CR first and then RC. But I would say before coming to CR, you do a little bit of understanding, develop a little bit of understanding of sentence structures so that you're able to read sentences better. You need to understand where to break and all. Okay. So skill-based learning is what is needed. Not this, if you remember, not this live, die, repeat kind of learning. Okay. If you're just randomly learning concepts, practicing questions, doing more questions, it's an endless loop. You will not be able to get out of this. Skill-based learning is important. And that's why you follow that skill-based learning. So that's something which is important for you guys to follow. Okay, I'll take up the questions now also. There have been some questions. So Sugadip says, what about the initial questions in my verbal mocks? I see fluctuation because of my accuracy in first 10 to 12 questions. Should I spend time spending more time? Sugadip, that's a very wrong thought process. If you just think that you're getting the questions wrong because of spending more time, you're wrong. Okay. You need to understand that if you need to spend more time in order to get them right, you're not at the stage where you can take mocks right now. You need to first improve by doing more practice questions, improve your understanding first, and then go to the next level of taking mocks. So go back to basics again, improve your timing through individual tests and bring it down to a time where you can do a question in approximately one and a 1.8 to two minutes and then start taking mocks again. Okay. So I'll take a WhatsApp question also I need to apply in round two. Should I wait and give GMAT again in December or should I work on my application? So again, uh, what's the uh, weather 660 will uh, be suffice or not uh, for you to kind of get into your target B school is the question. If you think 660 is good enough for your target B school, then you can go ahead and start working on an application. But if you think it is not, then I think you know the answer. You have to rewrite your GMAT because without a good enough school, you're not getting into a good school and you should not just compromise on the quality of the school just because you have a low GMAT score. That's something which you can work on and improve. Uh, and there are a lot of cases. I gave a few examples where people have improved their scores in a month's time also. So there are many, many cases which we have worked with, which we have dealt with and have improved people. You can also improve your score, but just make sure that you're not just giving up on your dream or sacrificing on the B school. So the answer to your question is basically dependent on basically uh, whether your B school will accept the score or not, 660. The second thing about the time management, again, time management, please understand if your timing is a problem in verbal, you, you are focusing on the wrong problem. If you're they're taking extra time to solve questions, the problem is not timing. Timing is an outcome. That is what you see is something which is going wrong. But the reason why you get the question wrong is not your timing is th the reason why you get the question wrong is your process so if you improve your process your timing improves you cannot improve your timing by thinking about timing to improve your timing you have to think about the process and that's what i am talking about here so i'm just taking an example of sc so if you want to start with sc try to learn all the concepts using a common thread which binds them all which is meaning so focus on meaning based learning so for example i talk about rc that you focus on how to read passages right Similarly, in, in for SC, you need to focus on mastering the meaning approach first. Understand how to break down individual sentences, how to understand individual sentences, and then go and apply that approach on individual type of topics like subject verb pairs, noun pronoun pairs, modifiers. So try to apply that later. So first step 
is to learn the right method. The next step is to apply the right method on each type of question. That's how you improve. So what are the right methods that I'm talking about? So there are three steps or three methods. SC requires meaning driven approach where you focus on the intended meaning of the sentence, understand logically it is making sense or not. CR requires not just pre-thinking, CR requires framework driven pre-thinking. RC requires you to be involved while you're reading the passage and evolve your reading as you move forward. Try to preempt also basically what's happening. Okay, so something this is what is required. And for every stage, every topic, try to follow these three steps. First, learn the concepts, then learn a methodical approach, and then go and practice the questions on the topic. Okay, that's something which is important. So I hope you guys now understand what is the solution. Let's move to the next stage, which is mastering this approach. But I'll take a question from a turnty. He says, I got a 660 with a verbal 32. I really struggled on CR and RC. How can I improve their RC is what I majorly get correct. So if you are getting RCs correct in CR and SC wrong, again, in CR, it is also a lot more about pre-thinking. It requ it's required much more than in RC and elsewhere. So you have to focus on pre-thinking in the right way. And again, uh, if again, pre-thinking, a lot of people think is just about pre-thinking the answer. It's not that. Pre-thinking is also about doing scope analysis. It is also about understanding what the author is hiding from you. Okay, so pre-thinking doesn't start after you read the entire pass par argument. It starts the moment you read the first line. It starts the moment you read the second line again. So that's how you do pre-thinking. And there are little, multiple steps involved in it. So again, Tonti, feel free to reach out to me, to schedule a call in my calendar. I would try to understand from you. Obviously, you have to see whether how you solve questions, and then only we can give you more feedback. But I'll be help you understand where you could be possibly going wrong with CR and SC. And if your SC is wrong, it's, there's high likelihood that you're focusing on grammar rules, not focusing on the rules from a meaning standpoint. RC, you can still get right if you are a good reader. You can still get them right. The answer is right there in the passage. In CR also, the answer is there in the passage, but there's some pre-thinking required. In SC, you also need to know the grammar rules. So again, uh, you can connect with me. I've given the link in the chat and I'll be able to guide you better. Okay, so now moving on to the mastering approach part. So we have talked about what is the right solution? What is the core problem? The core problem is that we approach verbal in not so logical way. We approach it in a mechanical way that, okay, we solve questions, learn concepts and solve more questions. The right solution is to focus on the right method of solving the questions. And now we'll talk about how to master the solution, how to take the solution to the next level so that we can actually get to a good score on GMAT. Okay, so how like this, this is where the solution part becomes very, very important. Now, most people focus on questions basically to learn that they will learn from by solving questions. That's where they think they will learn the most. That's a wrong thought process. You actually learn more from the solution. So instead of doing, giving more time on question solving or targeting that, okay, I'll do X questions in a day, focus more on the solution part and review the solutions well. And when you are reviewing the solutions, don't just review the solutions when you get them wrong, questions wrong. Review even the questions that you get correct and check whether your approach is right or not. That's something which is important. So always refer to solutions which are consistent, which are using the same method to solve all questions. If you refer to a question a solution style where a particular type of question solved in a different way, another type of question solved in a different way, you'll always be confused. So focus on questions which are used solutions which are consistent and using logical methods instead of shortcuts. It's very, very important that you do this. Otherwise, solution review part is not important for you. Verify each question irrespective of whether you get it right or wrong. And when you are doing solution analysis, please keep this in mind. 80% of your time that you are reviewing the solution should be spent on sentence analysis or the argument analysis or the passage analysis. Not 80% on the options. Most people just look at the options. Why they picked option A and option B. If you're just focusing on the options, you are just focusing on what went wrong. You are not focusing on why did you pick that choice? Why, where you went wrong with the process? So try to look at the solution, look at the analysis, check first, did you understand the context completely or not? Because if you don't understand the context in verbal, there is nothing that you can do. It's like, you don't understand the question in quant and you're trying to pick an option answer from the options. You can't do that. If you don't understand a part, even a small part of the uh, question in quant, na, you will actually get it wrong. The same thing applies for verbal. Okay, so focus on that. And when you are doing this analysis in the solution, for, for the solutions, 
note down the variances between your approach vis-a-vis -vis the right approach okay try to see okay this is how you are solving the question and this is how the right approach is supposed to be so try to note down those variances that's very very important okay and I, i'll just talk about another example of a student who actually improved from a 650 to 730 in just 24 days guys this guy is an amazing story akshat uh he worked with us in our very very early days i remember one of our uh, of, of students who actually uh, uh like he started working with us in the very first year i think of when we started our course gmat was back then and we are really proud of this guy because he was able to improve his verbal score considerably in just 24 days so if you want to watch his interview you can always do that by using this link but i'll just summarize what he did in this 24 days so he focused most importantly on improving his methodology so he saw from his esr in the 650 attempt that cr and rc is where he is poor so he focused more on the cr process of a framework driven pre thinking and how did he work on it he worked on it by reviewing the solutions in depth for the correct answers and in gmat as we have this habit of uh, mentioning each option uh, classifying each option into this buckets like distortion out of scope relevant opposite or not and he used to validate for each option like whenever he used to eliminate a choice he used to note down in his notebook that okay this choice a is basically a distortion uh, choice b is irrelevant and so on and then he used to match his valid reasons as well and then he made sure that in 24 days he revisits his weak areas and then he also ensured that he believed in himself during the test because anxiety was another issue that he was struggling with so he also did some bit of uh, meditation and all and all of that helped him improve his score considerably in just 24 days guys and there are multiple stories i can go on about so many different stories so many different examples every single year we help multiple people improve their scores and trust me guys before round 2 you can also do that if you really want to just make sure that you are focusing on the right areas okay now what should be a strategy to retake really if you need some strategy obviously we have to consider multiple factors including how much time is available with you what's your target score what kind of resources have you used what are your strengths and weaknesses what are the methods that you are using correctly it's possible that in cr you are using the right method in rc or not and then what's your learning style so obviously all of this i can't uh, think about all of you in the same session because obviously everyone is unique everyone is different so if you want to discuss one on one with me how gmat best team can help you with your verbal score feel free to reach out using this link and uh, schedule a call in my calendar i've shared the link in the chat already you can always do that uh, i will be happy to help you over there but a quick overview of how you should look at uh tackling the different topics so if you have already maintained an error log that's great if you have not then you need to take a maintainer error log where it shows you what your conceptual and process gaps are now at gmat this this error log is automated like people can go to their dashboard and see topics in which their score is shown as red is where they have conceptual gaps then topics in which your score is so in blue is where you have application gaps those who are not gmat this students uh they need to use this benchmarking that okay if your score is less than 60% your accuracy is less than 60% you have concept gaps in those areas and how to work on concept gaps is definitely something which is different uh from how to work on process gaps so if you have concept gaps you have to go back to the formulas again learn the formulas learn the concepts and then you have to learn how to solve individual questions and maybe you need to solve 15 to 20 questions also to improve on those areas on the other hand if you have application gaps then you don't have to waste your time on revisiting the concepts you probably know the concepts decently enough it's just the method where you're going wrong so how learn how to solve questions questions more methodically and then practice about 10 to 15 questions and when you are working on your weak areas uh like it could be because of your uh, conceptual issues it could be because of process uh, so you have to revise the concepts if it is conceptual in case of uh, process gaps and concept gaps in both the cases you have to work on your approach so try to review the solutions questions and try to focus on learning the right method that's something which is important and understand quality is more important than quantity okay so that's something which is important and then you have to scale it up so optimize your weak areas after you have optimized your weak areas after you have improved your approach on the weak areas then only you should go to take sectional tests and when i say sectional tests i mean tests for sc cr and rc individually so take individual tests over here you can improve your timing focus on your timing over here that okay i need to hit the timing correctly and that's when once you have achieved this timing and in the sectional test then you should go to taking mocks and if you work in this pattern you work on your weak areas first then improve your timing in sectional test and then you start taking mocks you would not need to take more than 4 to 5 mocks that should suffice in your case and that should give you the right score
Okay, so that's about it from my side today in the session. I'm opening the session now for an open-ended Q&A. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me right now. I'll be taking this question up. I'm going to be here with you uh, till the time you guys ask me questions. Okay, so I'm not going to keep an upper limit, but generally I see people asking questions. Only two, three people ask questions, but I'm happy to take up as many questions as you guys have. Okay, and in case you want to reach out to me later, you can use this email ID, piyush at the rate of gmatvis.com, or if you want to send an email to a broader gmatvis team, you can just send the mail to support at the rate of gmatvis.com. Both the email IDs work, uh, or you can also WhatsApp me on the number that is on your screen. So feel free to ask me any questions, guys. More than happy to have discussions with you. Any questions that is there on your mind. And this is the link uh, to schedule a call on my calendar. If you just want to directly speak to me, you can use this link to schedule a call. OK? So guys, shoot your questions. Happy to take them up. I think I took up all the questions that were asked earlier. What's up, Shudeep? And I think to turn to TIC, only these people asked a few questions. OK. I still don't see any other question, guys. I hope you guys found this session to be really helpful. And if you really found the session to be really helpful, then do give it a like, do give this uh, video a thumbs up as well. We're really, really happy to uh, uh, see that. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me and do share this videos with your friends who are struggling with bubble. I hope these strategies do help you in improving your score. Okay, Abu says, I scored 15 points less in verbal on my actual test compared to my marks. I think my concepts are fairly clear, so I don't know why this happened. And how can I let it not happen again the next time? So Apurva, do schedule a discussion on my calendar. I would need to ask you a lot of questions because honestly, 15 points less in your verbal score doesn't make sense if you're taking good mock tests. Sometimes people take a uh, very well-known mock test, not very well-known uh, uh, mock test, which is very uh, affordable, let's use that word, which is not really reflective of the actual GMAT also. So it's important that we have to understand which kind of mocks were you taking. And if it's a good mock test, then this 15 point drop should not have happened. So we have to understand the reason. So feel uh, free to schedule a call in my calendar. I'll be happy to discuss about that uh, because I can then ask you questions and get answers. Otherwise, uh, it will become difficult. OK, uh, send a mail to enroll for the last month of my prep. Great, Shubhadeep. You'll definitely hear back from us very soon. Best strategy that comes to your mind to solve CR takeaway. Again, the best strategy is the framework driven pre-thinking that I was talking about. And you'll find a lot of uh, our videos on framework driven pre-thinking in uh, on our YouTube channel of GMATVIS. And you can also find a lot of those strategies in our free trial also. So I'll just give you the link for our uh, free trial. Uh, you can check it out, Dexter, over there. What do you mean by pre-thinking again? Uh, it's very difficult for me to tease that pre-thinking uh, thing in a couple of minutes. Obviously, you have to learn it in a step-by-step -step fashion. But you can go through our free trial and get a decent understanding of it. And go to GMATVIS YouTube channel and you'll understand a lot more. There are many videos that we have done on that. In fact, we have done some videos on GMAT Club YouTube channel as well on this very channel on framework driven pre-thinking. But you can just check this uh, free trial out. There are some videos which will explain you what this framework driven pre-thinking is all about. OK, I hope that answers your questions, Dexter. Great, guys, so I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I hope uh, I was able to answer all your questions. Feel free to send your emails or your WhatsApp text to me on this number. Just schedule a call on my calendar. That's the easy way, easiest way to reach me out. So it was great having you guys today. And I uh, once again, uh, Wish all of all the Indian students a very, very happy Diwali. I hope this weekend and this extended weekend or holidays uh, really bring the light in your life, the joy in your life, and all the best for GMAR preparation from my side. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, if you can be a part of your journey, we would love to be and help you become the next example. Probably, who knows, one month, two months, three months down the line, I might be having another session where I will probably show your uh, photo or your example on the screen. Who knows that? So all the best and uh, give your hundred percent and do give it this video a like if you really like the session. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good evening. Bye bye.